12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Rule number five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Actually, it's not okay. Recently, I watched a three-year-old boy trail his mother and father slowly through a crowded airport. He was screaming violently at five-second intervals, and, more important, he was doing it voluntarily. He wasn't at the end of his tether. As a parent, I could tell from the tone. He was irritating his parents and hundreds of other people to gain attention. Maybe he needed something. But that was no way to get it, and his parents should have let him know. You might object that perhaps they were worn out and jet-lagged after a long trip, but 30 seconds of carefully directed problem-solving would have brought this shameful episode to a halt. More thoughtful parents would not have let someone they truly cared for become the object of a crowd's contempt. I have also watched a couple, unable or unwilling to say no to their two-year-old, obliged to follow closely behind him everywhere he went, every moment of what was supposed to be an enjoyable social visit, because he misbehaved so badly when not micromanaged that he could not be given a second of genuine freedom without risk. The desire of his parents to let their child act without correction on every impulse perversely produced the precisely opposite effect. They deprived him instead of every opportunity to engage in independent action. Because they did not dare to teach him what no means, he had no conception of the reasonable limits enabling maximal toddler autonomy. It was a classic example of too much chaos breeding too much order and the inevitable reversal. I have, similarly, seen parents rendered unable to engage in adult conversation at a dinner party because their children, four and five, dominated the social scene, eating the centers out of all the sliced bread, subjecting everyone to their juvenile tyranny, while mom and dad watched, embarrassed, and bereft of the ability to intervene. When my now adult daughter was a child, another child once hit her in the head with a metal toy truck. I watched that same child one year later viciously push his younger sister backwards over a fragile glass-surfaced coffee table. His mother picked him up immediately afterward, but not her frightened daughter, and told him in hushed tones not to do such things while she patted him comfortingly in a manner clearly indicative of approval. She was out to produce a little god-emperor of the universe. That's the unstated goal of many a mother, including many who consider themselves advocates for full gender equality. Such women will object vociferously to any command uttered by an adult male, but will trot off in seconds to make their progeny a peanut butter sandwich if he demands it, while immersed self-importantly in a video game. The future mates of such boys have every reason to hate their mother-in-law. Respect for women? That's for other boys, other men, not their dear sons. Something of the same sort may underlie in part the preference for male children seen most particularly in places such as India, Pakistan, and China, where sex-selective abortion is widely practiced. The Wikipedia entry for that practice attributes its existence to cultural norms favoring male over female children. I cite Wikipedia because it's collectively written and edited, and therefore the perfect place to find accepted wisdom. But there's no evidence that such ideas are strictly cultural. There are plausible psychobiological reasons for the evolution of such an attitude, and they're not pretty from a modern egalitarian perspective. If circumstances force you to put all your eggs into one basket, so to speak, a son is a better bet by the strict standards of evolutionary logic, where the proliferation of your genes is all that matters. Why? Well, a reproductively successful daughter might gain you eight or nine children, the Holocaust survivor Yudha Schwartz, a star in his regard, had three generations of direct descendants who matched such performance. She was the ancestor of almost 2,000 people by the time of her death in 2010. But the sky is truly the limit with a reproductively successful son. Sex with multiple female partners is his ticket to exponential reproduction, given our species' practical limitation to single births. Rumor has it that the actor Warren Beatty and the athlete Wilt Chamberlain each bedded multiple thousands of women, something not unknown as well among rock stars. They didn't produce children in those numbers. Modern birth control limits that. But similar celebrity types in the past have done so. The forefather of the Qing dynasty, Jiu Kang, uh, <laughs> how do you say that? 
Chu Kang Ga, circa 1550, for example, is the male line ancestor of a million and a half people in northeastern China. Jeez, I gotta read that again. The male line ancestor of a million and a half people in northeastern China. The medieval Yunnao, <laughs> what's up with these names right now? Dynasty, Yunnao dynasty, produced up to three million male descendants, localized mainly in northwestern Ireland and the U.S. through Irish immigration. And the king of them all, Genghis Khan, conqueror of much of Asia, is a forefather of 8% of the men in Central Asia. 16 million male descendants, 34 generations later. So, from a deep biological perspective, there are reasons why parents might favor sons sufficiently to eliminate female fetuses. Although, I am not claiming direct causality, nor suggesting a lack of other, more culturally dependent reasons. Preferential treatment awarded a son during development might even help produce an attractive, well-rounded, confident man. This happened in the case of the father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, by his own account. A man who has been the indisputable favorite of his mother keeps for life the feeling of a conqueror, the confidence of success that often introduces real success. Fair enough. But feeling of a conqueror can all too easily become actual conqueror. Genghis Khan's outstanding reproductive success certainly came at the cost of any success whatsoever for others, including the dead millions of Chinese, Persians, Russians, and Hungarians. Spoiling a son might therefore work well from the standpoint of the selfish gene, allowing the favored child's genes to replicate themselves in innumerable offspring. To use the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins' famous expression. But it can make for a dark, painful spectacle in the here and now, and mutate into something indescribably dangerous. None of this means that all mothers favor all sons over their daughters, or that daughters are not sometimes favored over sons, or that fathers don't sometimes favor their sons. Other factors can clearly dominate. Sometimes, for example, Unconscious hatred, sometimes not so unconscious either, overrides any concern a parent might have for any child, regardless of gender or personality or situation. I saw a four-year-old boy allowed to go hungry on a regular basis. His nanny had been injured, and he was being cycled through the neighbors for temporary care. When his mother dropped him off at our house, she indicated that he wouldn't eat at all, all day. That's okay, she said. It wasn't okay, in case that's not obvious. This was the same four-year-old boy who clung to my wife for hours in absolute desperation and total commitment when she tenaciously, persistently, and mercifully managed to feed him an entire lunchtime meal, rewarding him throughout for his cooperation and refusing to let him fail. He started out with a closed mouth, sitting with all of us at the dining room table, my wife and I, our two kids, and two neighborhood kids we looked after during the day. She put the spoon in front of him, waiting patiently, persistently, while he moved his head back and forth, refusing it entry, using defensive methods typical of a recalcitrant and none too well attended two-year-old. She didn't let him fail. She patted him on the head every time he managed a mouthful, telling him sincerely that he was a good boy when he did so. She did think he was a good boy. He was a cute, damaged kid. Ten, not too painful minutes later, he finished his meal. We were all watching intently. It was a drama of life and death. Look, she said, holding up his bowl, you finished all of it. This boy who was standing in the corner voluntarily and unhappily when I first saw him, who wouldn't interact with the other kids, who frowned chronically, who wouldn't respond to me when I tickled and prodded him, trying to get him to play, this boy broke immediately into a wide, radiant smile. It brought joy to everyone at the table. Twenty years later, writing it down today, it still brings me to tears. Afterward, he followed my wife around like a puppy for the rest of the day, refusing to let her out of his sight. When she sat down, he jumped in her lap, cuddling in, opening himself back up to the world, searching desperately for the love he had been continually denied. Later in the day, but far too soon, 
his mother reappeared. She came down from the stairs into the room we all occupied. Oh, super mom, she uttered, resentfully, seeing her son curled up in my wife's lap. Then she departed, black, murderous heart unchanged, doomed child in hand. She was a psychologist. The things you can see with even a single open eye. It's no wonder that people want to stay blind. <laughs>